Hello and welcome to a beginner's Photoshop tutorial. Uh, for this I'm using CS3 and if you're at a later edition um, you'll pretty much be able to follow along no problem. Stuff will just be in maybe a slightly different spot but if you know how to use any version of Photoshop you know how to use every version of Photoshop. It's a matter of just relocating where they may have moved a tool or adjusted how something works but generally speaking they're all going to be the same. I've been using it for 17 years and you can quite easily jump from learning Photoshop 3 or 4 to learning Photoshop CS3 uh, once you get the feel for really any Adobe program it's the same thing uh, you'll just have to relocate some stuff but generally speaking it's gonna work pretty much the same so let me get rid of this when you first open Photoshop uh, I've actually set this to the default view so this is what it should look like when you first launch it there's going to be some windows all over the screen and again I'm doing this for someone who's never used it before so I'm going to try to approach this in a way that makes it easy for someone who doesn't know even have a clue what they're looking at this is their first time looking at Photoshop um, what you have is you've got your menu commands up here you've got what I'm just going to call sort of a tools menu right across here you have your toolbar in these areas over here which are just windows which will have more options more controls which we're going to get into individually one at a time for now I think it's easy just to say what you should have up to start with and what you really don't need to look at all of these little windows can be expanded or collapsed with the button up here and all of them can be moved expanded can be moved where you want them closed and reopened by going to the window command on the menu bar and finding the one you're looking for for example this is the toolbar as I mentioned if suddenly you look around and your toolbar is missing for some reason or you you've or you lost it somehow simple thing to do is just go down here and say is my toolbar checked see if I unclick it it is gone if I need to bring it back there it is and that goes with any of them for the basis of this beginning tutorial I really only want to keep up the history one so I'm gonna close this actions one see how they're all individual tabs I don't need any of these right now really the only thing I want for the purpose of this is to have this layers one, the channels I can pretty much close at this point, paths I'll keep open. The windows are also nice because they behave in a way that lets you sort of magnetically snap them together. See if I approach this slowly you'll see it snap to it. So it lets you just keep the workspace neater if I bring them all over like that. You can also click on a tab, bring it next to another tab, and now they're both sharing that same window space and you just click between the tabs. You can expand them, like I said, close them, minimize them like that, whatever you need to do to make the workspace cleaner. And they also snap to the edge like that if you see. If you get a workspace that's completely to your liking and how you want it every single time, that's what these are. When you open it you can see everything laid out, basically what they want to call it is your workspace you can go to window workspace and you can save that workspace and we'll put it down here in a list of the ones that's already pre-created or that you saved and if you ever get to a place where it's totally all over the place and you want to put it back to yours you can just click on it for example the way we have it right now I'm gonna save this as tutorial and click save if I was to or someone else used it and they switched it to something crazy something different has all kinds of stuff that I don't usually use I can go to workspace and click on tutorial and that'll bring it back to the way I like it if you have multiple users on a computer that's really great everybody can just save their own other ones across the top that we're going to use for this tutorial if you ever get lost uh, I can't stress help is just really nice just use help if things are just not working out correctly 
and like any other program on a computer file is where you're going to see new open and your save commands so for the time being I'm just going to create a new document real quick file new you also notice that everything in Photoshop has a quick command control N control O almost everything you'll see there's even certain F keys that'll open windows for you quickly you'll see there's shortcut keys for a lot of what you can do in Photoshop and the more you learn those the quicker your your workflow can be if you're making a new document you have some presets eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper film or video if you're gonna make a like a title card or something that's gonna go into a slideshow well do you have it in full screen or do you have it in widescreen that's great for that kind of video stuff web sizes 640 480 800 by 600 these are pretty much like default monitor sizes a lot of wet or like what size web pages might be built at your photo landscape 4 by 6 5 by 7 8 by 10 9 out of 10 times you're just going to use custom and put in whatever you want now you want to make sure you check off what you're doing if you click in pixels and you say I want to do a you know I want to do a 4 by 6 image well 4 by 6 pixels is smaller than an icon you gotta make sure you're on the right see that's what it actually ended up being point zero thirteen inches you gotta make sure you're on the right uh, measurement and in that case you really gotta also make sure if you oh, want to do something that's you know 1000 pix uh, pixels and you do 1000 inches you've got a 1.51 gigabyte file size already so you gotta watch what you're doing there if you're not careful you can make a mess for this I'm going to do a 5 by 5 resolution and this is something that's actually taken me some time to think about how I want to approach resolution for someone who may or may not really know what it's all about what it really means is it's the pixels per square inch it says pixels per inch in an image so it's how many dots per square inch so if you can look at an example like this real quick okay here's my little uh, resolution example this here on the left is my apple that is set at 300 pixels per inch so when it, when we went to new this was set to 300 this one on, over here on the right is one that was set to 72 only 72 pixels per inch and a lot of times Photoshop is going to default to 72 when it's on your screen it really doesn't look too bad when you print it or when you start to zoom up on it for any reason whatsoever that's when you're going to notice so the one that's the 300 dots per inch on the left I'm going to zoom up here on the stem of the apple so it basically fills the screen now on the 72 dots per inch, I'm going to do the same exact thing, same exact zoom, and you see it like that. What it comes down to is there is a lot less information there. So when you print it, it's going to be the higher quality print is going to be with the higher level of resolution. So getting back to where we were, I tend to leave it at 200 if I'm doing something just for that's going to be only on the computer. If I'm ever going to print it out, I like to go well above 300 and it just gives it a, a higher quality image when you're finally done so for this one let's uh, let's only leave it at 200 it's not necessary to go real real high for this color mode um, this this gets down to print stuff grayscale obviously you know it's black and white um, RGB color is really all you're gonna need for computer land CMYK is gonna be something you're gonna use more for print it's not something that I want to get into for a beginning tutorial, so just leave it RGB color, 8-bit. Your background content's transparent. Um, you don't need to worry about the advanced stuff, by the way. Transparent means when you build it, it's going to look like this. You have the little checker boxes. If we do another one, and instead of transparent, I say make the background white. There you go. And you get the idea. You can switch it to whatever color you want. So right now we have a new document. We're going to go down here over to the toolbar. Now what I need you to notice is the menu part of the toolbar. This menu 
up here. Whenever I click something, that changes. So every one of these tools has a ton of options per tool. Also, what you should notice is on this toolbar, these little down arrows mean that there's more. Rather than show you every single tool, when you click and hold, you see that there's more under that little icon. So to go down the list of what things do, at least what you know you should know for the beginning stuff. Uh, the main one they like to call it the move tool. It's the pointer. It's what's going to take things and move them around. Let me just uh, paste in an image real quick so we can have something to work with. Okay, so here we are with the Apple image. With the move tool, simple as that. You can move things. The selection tool. If you use a rectangle, you're making a rectangle. If you use the elliptical tool, you're making the elliptical ellipse. And so forth and so on. What does that let you do? That lets you create a box, and if I went back to the move tool, I can move that. I'm going to click Edit Undo. What you should also notice is what's up here. Whenever you have a tool on, something you might use with this little selection tool is see so if I do like this and I press delete, there you go, you got a quick little circle missing out of the apple. If I hit this feather, let's say we make that feather, I don't know, 20, and I redraw this circle real quick and I press delete, you see what that does. It feathers the selection. And I'm clicking undo. We're going to sidetrack for two seconds because I believe it helps to know what, what's going on with the history window. The reason I told you to keep this one open is in Photoshop, if you do something, create a circle, press delete. I have one undo, I, and then if I go to it again, I can redo it. It's either redo or undo. However, in the history window, you can see everything we've done. So I can go back up to something else that I did. So if I was to take that and move that piece right there, take that, move that piece right there, and then deselect. If I went to edit undo, I could only undo my deselect. That's it. If I go to my history, I can go back up more steps. So that's why we kept that one open. Because your undo is limited to really one undo, one redo. So your history panel is do any kind of undos or to go back to a previous step. You also might have noticed me do something when I said I was deselecting. If I redo that, under select, because you're making a selection, so under select, you have deselect, you have select all, which then puts the selection around the entire image. You have inverse, and you really don't need to worry about any further than that, but just these four. Inverse would be if I went like that, if I click inverse, then it's everything but that. So if I press delete right now, that's the only thing left. The lasso tool is making a freehand selection. The magnetic one and the polygon one. The polygon tool tends to make straight lines. And when you get back to the where you're going to complete it, you'll see the little circle appears. And your selection is done. The magnetic one will tend to look for the most contrast between a layer and try to see what it is you're actually going for. Let me zoom in and try to make that clear. Um, down here at the bottom, you have the magnifying glass. So you can either click or you can drag an area. All I did was click and hold and let go. So if I went in here with the magnetic lasso tool and dragged it near the edge of this apple 
I don't have to be too precise. See how I'm kind of going off a little bit? Well, I messed it up there. But if you're somewhat precise with it, it kind of gets the idea of what you're going for, and you don't have to have a perfect steady hand. Now, if you also go up and you mess with these settings, then you'll start to learn what you know more can do. The, the best way I can tell you to learn Photoshop is to trial and error. Just m mess with settings, play with stuff. Always pre-save your work. Always save your work often. But practice and actually hands-on is what's going to do it. And now I'd like, like to zoom back out, so I'm going to go to View, Zoom Out, or I can go to View, Fit on Screen, or a great shortcut, Control Plus, Control Minus. And use those continuously. The Magic Wand tool. If you hold it down, you see a quick selection, and you see the regular Magic Wand. Magic wand tool, invaluable. Um, like right now, for example, if I wanted to get rid of that white, you can mess with your settings up here. You'll see what they do by just trial and error. Learn, practice, see what they do. Um, not, I can't go through every single one. But for this one, tolerance set at 50 with the magic wand tool. I'm going to click the area of white, and there it is. It highlighted anything of that color. Delete. It's gone. Just like that. And I'm gonna if I go back up here, if I click the green, it's highlighting most of the green. And this is where we start to mess with the settings. I'm gonna put the tolerance to say 70, click that green again, got a little more of it. So by clicking the green, I've highlighted all that similar green, I've pressed delete and it's gone. But it's a great function for something like this. If you want to put an apple on an image, but it came on a white background because you just snagged it off Google real quick. You jump in here real quick, you click on the white background, you click delete, it's gone. Okay, the other tool, the quick selection one, um, you can kind of mess with it. You see how it's it's looking for similar colors, it's grabbing what it thinks you're looking for, like that. Or if I wanted to tell to try to grab the entire apple, I could come in here and see how I grabbed the apple and looked for all the similar colors. This is a trim tool. This is a sort of finalized trim tool. Go like this. You say OK. To say OK, you hit the check mark, you can hit enter, you can double click. You've just cropped the entire canvas itself. The whole the whole project is down to that size now, not just the image. This tool is cropping the canvas itself. Your paintbrush, this comes back to your simple stuff. Up here in your properties, I'm going to lower the diameter of the brush size. Turn my opacity to 100, and I'm painting with green. And you can learn by messing with stuff, um, mess with well all these different options, and see what they do. Overlay, for example, I'll go to overlay, and I'll say opacity maybe 75%. And I come in here, and I'm can turn the apple green slowly. You know how how would you use that? Well, if you opened up, let me open up a picture. Say you were a realtor or something, and you had a shot of grass in uh, front of a house and the grass was kind of dead. You came in here, you selected a nice green for the grass, you put it to overlay, you adjust your opacity, let me adjust my brush size so it don't take me all day, and you come in here and you kind of paint up some of the dead grass, make it a little nicer. And you know, you take your time, you do it right, but that's just how something like that would be used. Your stamp tool. What you need to do for your stamp tool, let me adjust the size of the stamp. It's sort of like a cloning tool. They call it the cloning tool or stamp tool. Um, you have to use Alt, and you'll get that when you click Alt, and click a part of the image, and now go paint somewhere you're literally painting with that part of the image. So if I click right here, I'm going to paint with that part of the apple right there. How could you possibly use something like that? Well, that's, I mean, that's just the basis of stuff for touching up images for or things that are, you know, imperfections in photographs or anything. I mean, as an, I'll go as an example. If you went in, 
you know, say this was an imperfection in a beautiful model photograph, we go to a different brush size, and we alt click right here, and we put that right there, and we all click right here, and we put that right there, all click right here, put that right there, and we so we're painting with the image itself to get rid of any kind of imperfections. That's just you know one of the ways you could possibly use that tool. There's a history brush. Um, it's a more complicated tool. Basically, it's almost like having an undo paintbrush. So if I, with the normal paintbrush, I desaturated this whole thing, and then maybe I came over here and I turned it to normal, and I grabbed green and I painted some green lines over it. With the history tool, I could tell it to go back to a certain point over here. I could tell it to where I click here, that's where the history brush is going to go. That's the point of this little box here. If I go tell it that the, I want the history brush to go to this time I did this effect, I can go over here and paint with that. Undo. Say I wanted to go back before I even did the whole black and white thing. I went all, I'll go all the way back. I'm going to just go back up too going up before I even did that because it's it's referring to what happened back then and it, and it's going to paint to that history of your image your eraser and eraser tools gradients and a paint bucket paint bucket just fills one whole area if it's the same color gradient makes a gradient your blur tool sharpen and smudge they're almost self-explanatory I mean your blur is blurring the image your smudge is gonna smudge the image and your sharpen will sharpen an image your dodge tool your burn tool for that let me bring up an actual photograph to explain dodge and burn open um, mountain that's a good one dodge and burn refers to film when you were making prints from film, if you dodge an image, you were actually shading it from the light coming through. So when you made your print, that part ended up being lighter. Um, when you burnt it, that mean, meant you were holding the image into the light more. You were burning the image in more. So that's what, where the, the terms come from. And by do, if you know that, then you know that dodge will make something lighter. We go to midtones. I'm going to go to 50%. Dodge will make something lighter. So say this area down here got too dark, you can make it lighter. Now if you did this gradually, you know, it could actually really help out an image. See, I'm bringing up some of the light that I lost over there. Some of that got a little dark, whatever. If you go to burn, and you come in here, and how about that, that pika is a little bit darker. A little bit more contrasty. That shadow's more intense. It's it's different from doing a um, lightening or darkening, a brightness contrast adjustment. It's taking more of the color and shadows into into consideration when it's doing this. Your pen tool can be used to make a shape or make a very specific selection. So, for example, if I was to go up here and start making it, drawing with it, it's going to start filling with green because that's the color I have selected, and I made a green shape. Um, if I go back, and sometimes you do want it to fill in. Other times you don't want it to fill in. So if you see, as soon as I start drawing with this, if you watch up here on the right, my layer's highlighted, it's telling me I'm drawing a shape. If I turn the fill to zero so I don't have to see the green, and I keep drawing, well I can go in here and trace that mountain real carefully for an hour and a half, of my life and I come back around and you see the little, the little circle logo up here and I click and I've got a complete shape if I go to paths and I go down here I tell that to become a selection now I've got now it's as if I used a selection tool but now with that path tool I've been able to be real specific on what I want to delete this is a very very valuable tool right here you're trying to cut somebody out of a background that you can't just do a one-click magic 
wand and remove all your blue or whatever and you need to go in and trace real carefully that's what you want to do you draw your shape you connect back around and you tell it to become a selection and now what you can do is you can click that layer and I can click say delete and I deleted that specifically that portion of the image right out or if I didn't want to delete it I only wanted to affect a very very specific area of the screen with when I came in with say the da, the burn tool and I came in and now it's only going to affect that area so your path that's your path tool and also whatever path you make will create a new shape so if I made that one and then I made one over here and I'm talking these are real specific ones say you take your time and you do them right like this one for this one I'm shut the fill all the way down and I'm making my line over a long time to cut out the mountain and put a new background behind it when you go back to them then you can go to path and say make something a selection and you get rid of that fill on that and you have that selection so in other words you can always go back to it by making that whereas if you were to make a selection with say the lasso tool over a long period of time it took you forever to do it as soon as you do something else it disappears you can't go back to that you can't refer to that so that's why paths are what you want to do if you want to be able to get back to a selection use it for something else for the text tool when you click it you'll see up here options appear your fonts your style the size some things like centered left right justified color generally though when you use your text tool you want to go to window and you want to bring up the character window and for me it actually brought up the paragraph one with it but a lot of times you want to make sure that comes up too it's just good to have them both when you're writing text and you can mess with each thing and see what they do but like for example this is like the opening title screen for when this whole tutorial started so I'll turn thing black and I'll click somewhere and then I'll type um, Photoshop tutorial and I'll use my moving tool and I'll move it where it wants to be let me zoom in a little bit here you can use the tool the text tool again to highlight it or you can double click on the icon part and you'll get control over the text again and you can change the color and you can change the size and you can tell it to be bold and underline and if you have a lot of text and this goes into just general text programs any word processing program is all going to be the same type of stuff but um, item one this is here more text here and that's where you will get into using the paragraph thing see that's the only ones highlighted right now if I go and I highlight it all I'm adjusting if I don't have it if I just double click it instantly highlights all if you wanna only have one part underlined or another part not underlined just highlight that individual it's not gonna treat it as one big block of text it will treat it individually so if I wanted just the word Photoshop to be large so that's just a quick concept of the text tool. There's a whole lot more to it, trust me. But like I said, it's just a beginning run through, beginner's tutorial. I'm going to go down to the eyedropper. This is where you, if you click anywhere on the screen, it's going to change you, what paint color you have to that. So you see it moving. If I actually click the paint color, I can click what color I want. Or if I just scroll off this area onto the background, you see it becomes an eyedropper again. And you can see the color instantly changes to whatever it's picking up there. If I just hold it down, you can see all those numbers and colors changing as I go across it. Kind of all in the blues and down. You get the idea. The hand tool, another important one. If we're zoomed in, let me switch to the magnifying glass for a second. If we're zoomed in, 
and I need to go and look over on the other side, I use the hand tool and I'm moving the entire document. The difference is if I go to use the pointer tool, the move tool itself, and I go to click to move, I'm moving whatever layer I'm on. I'm not moving an image. I'm moving the layer. So that's why you want to use the hand tool to move your entire document over if you're trying to work on a different spot. And now I want to get into the concept of layers because that's the most important part of Photoshop. Right here we have what looks like just an apple and an orange on the background. When in reality I have them on individual layers. So if I hide, that's the little eyeball, if I hide the orange layer, we just have the apple. And you get the idea there. What does that let you do? Well, that lets me, if I want to come in here and I want to turn, let's say, the apple black and white for some strange reason, I get my settings where I want them, I get my brush size where I want it, and I come in, and I can come in here and I'm painting with black, but when I go over the apple, it's turning black and white. If I go over here, I'm not affecting the orange because I'm not on the orange layer. The orange is totally fine. He's on his own layer. Let me undo for a second. I'll give you another example. If I move the apple, see it's behind the orange. What you have to imagine with layers is, is that it's as if it's on a pane of glass, perfectly see-through. So each layer is affecting only its own layer, and when we're done, we're looking all the way through it, it looks like a solid image. So if I was to come in here with a paintbrush and some blue paint and just go nuts like that and I'm on the orange layer, well if I hide that layer, my apple's totally fine. Even though it looks like I painted all over it, it's completely fine. So if you want to know like, well, why is that so important or if I'm not sold on what layers really do, this is actually a quick little document I made, a little DVD case for a short film I made. Um, and so this is your little, what, what would be printed out and what would fold into the DVD case itself. And if you look at the layers, everything is set up in its own layer so that I can adjust one thing without ruining the, the other thing. So the whole background is a layer. The image up there is a different layer so that I can recolor that, I can adjust that, I can move that where I want to match up without destroying the background same thing the text is all on its own layers individually so if I manipulate this the text for the spine of the DVD I'm not destroying the background I'm not destroying the text across the top the layers are a way of organizing everything you do so if I brought in this shot of the lawn again and if I actually drag it on top of that one, I'm bringing that image in, it became another layer. So if I name that Apple, and I double click and name this Lawn, if I bring the Apple on top by dragging, I'll drag the Lawn down, we'll go to that same thing, the Magic Wand tool, I'll delete the background, now we've got the Apple. I've got control of each. If I click the lawn, I can remove the lawn where I want to. If I click the apple, I can move the apple where I want to. And again, if I'm going to manipulate something, you know, we'll do it on blue. If I'm going to manipulate something, I don't have to worry about ruining something else. If I click lawn and I have the paintbrush, even though the apple's on top, I'm painting everything but the apple because that's not the layer that is selected. I'm only working on the layer that I am on. And if I click the apple and I tell it I want to make the apple bright orange and I start painting and I start painting the apple bright orange and everything else orange it looks like I'm destroying the grass too. But if I hide that orange the grass is fine. I never touch the grass layer. So that gives you a basis of what what layers will do for you. And the layers window, as with every window in Photoshop, has a drop-down menu up here that you click and you get more options for that window. 
and that goes for anything. If I'm on paths and I click here, I get options for paths. Uh, over here, the history one, if I click that, I get some options for that for any window. For the layers one, you may want to use new layer, and you name it, and you have yourself a new layer. Make sure you're highlighted on the one that you actually want to be working on. Merge down, merge visible, and flatten image are ones that are commonly used. And as an example, I'm working on this layer two right here. I'll come over there with a paintbrush and I'll switch my color to something real quick and I'll draw something on here. Now I still have individual layers. If I hide that, I still have it. If I go to merge down, it's just going to merge from the one I was on down. So now that's become one full layer, the paint and the apple. If I undo that, if I go into the history, if you do merge visible, that's everything with its eye turned on. If you turn one off, for example, I turn off the apple and I go merge visible, the background and the paint got merged. So it's only ones with the eyes up, the eyes open. And flatten image is if uh, it's something you you really barely need anymore in the later versions. Earlier versions you wanted to, you had to flatten an image before you could save it as a JPEG or something to send off. Um, now when you go to save something, it's pretty much does it on its own so you can actually you don't even really need to do flatten image anymore but that just basically brings everything down to one layer and before I wrap this up the only other thing you would need really to get by in this first tutorial is to know that you just go to save as as you would with any document and you want to pick if you have layers that you're still working with, you want to save it as a Photoshop so that it's still able to be edited in Photoshop. Once you choose something like JPEG, you flatten the image down so it's no longer you no longer have any layer information. It's all become one image. And that's something you'd want to send the final version in a different file format other than Photoshop. If you're doing any editing still, you want to keep it in Photoshop. Um, as far as the what all these file types are, that's something you can look up on your own. Um, take me forever to go through every one of them. The most common you want to use for final projects to, to send out or do what you're doing or print, JPEG is pretty much what you're going to use. Leave it as the Photoshop document if you're still editing stuff. And it gives you a basis of your tools, basis of the windows and everything on the screen and kind of what it's doing. So that's sort of all I got really for this kind of opening beginners look at Photoshop and there will be a lot more tutorials where this came from and we'll get into more details of things people actually want to use it for